I shot myself in the, in the thigh once with a nail gun. I picked it up while I was on my lap and bow. I had to go get a tetanus shot because it swole up like crazy. I worked the rest of the day though, but when I got off the roof, I couldn't walk. Everyone's story is different. Everyone's path is different. You don't know what's actually gonna hit you in life. Like I was pretty comfortable in my life before all this happened. Working with Dontre got me into this crap. You know, I was a middle child and Dontre, he was the baby. This is something that he was doing to just, you know, make sure he kept money in his pocket. It was like we had to look out for him. We couldn't let nothing happen to, to the baby. I just hope that people can understand that Dontre was a person who, who didn't deserve to die, who didn't deserve to be shot 14 times. On April 30th, Dontre went to Red L Park. He called me, and I was like, you know, what's up, Dontre? Where you at? You know, he was like, I'm at the park. He sounded real at ease, you know, not really out of the ordinary. What he looked like to me that day was just a student nearing the end of the semester and was just hanging out in the park, taking a break. I walked right across the street here, came up this way, and Dontre was laying right here. He had like a little bedroll and a backpack. His head was here and his feet were pointing west. I didn't know if he was sleeping or, or just resting or kind of struck me that he was just laying there. Yeah, I thought the place that he decided to, to rest outside was, was odd, but I thought he was a college student, really. The person I was working with that day called the police because they were concerned about him being so close to business. The first officers approached him, they sat him up, they talked to him, and then they left. My coworker was talking about how they were gonna call again, and I said, you know, if he was doing something illegal, they wouldn't have just walked away and left him there. A second call was made anyhow, and the officers actually came back up to us, and they said, hey, there's nothing to enforce, he's not breaking the law, uh, please stop calling. And honestly, I even forgot about the whole thing until later when a third officer showed up. From what we were told, when the call came through dispatch, it went to the beat cop's sergeant. And he left a message on the beat cop's cell phone. Hey, Chris. Hey, I just got a call from uh, your uh, people there at the Starbucks by Red Arrow Park. They say there's a homeless guy that's sleeping alongside there if you want to check on him. He's a black male. This officer called in the dispatch. Is there something on the board uh, for Red Arrow Park? I just got a call from uh, the sergeant. 1246, that's a negative. And dispatch told him that it was clear over at Red Arrow Park. All right, if you could create a trouble with subject at Starbucks, uh, you could use This officer water. then went and told him to get up off the ground, and the officer began to pat him down. I heard them before I saw them. Sounds of kind of fighting and two, I mean, grown men, like wrestling, essentially. And the officer apparently backed up and withdrew his baton, and the individual twisted away from the officer, pulling the baton out of his grip. The officer did, like, kind of lunge for the weapon once, missed, and then when that happened, Dontre swung at the officer's hand, didn't hit him. I never saw any contact between the two. And then it kind of went back to where they were. So the officer's back here. They're probably, again, 15 feet apart at this point. And that's when the officer pulled out his gun and aimed it at Dontre. I knew it was about to happen, so I turned away. And that's when I counted 12 or more shots. 1246, 1246, shots fired, shots fired, officer involved. Guy started beating me, started beating me, got out of my bag, 
It's going to hit me in the head with my own bat and shots fired. Uh, Starbucks, Starbucks, help right now. Uh, give me medical, too. He's going to need medical shots. Multiple times to the chest. Black male, he's about 20. I don't even know if I was hit. It was close combat. I need an officer to help me here, too. That day, I didn't see the news. The subject began to beat the officer with the wooden baton, striking him in the head. The officer withdrew his side. The police detectives came to my house, put me in a car, and interviewed me about all my sons. You know, and they questioned my mother in this car for like 30 to 45 minutes. I, I was just puzzled, like, what do they want at 12 o'clock? What's the problem? And I told them, Nate has his own business. He said, what do uh, Dontre do? I say, Dontre actually works uh, with a couple of temp agencies because of his illness, he hasn't been able to keep a job. The officer that was sitting next to me put his head down, and I asked him what was going on. And he was like, well, um, that was an altercation at Red Arrow Park. Um, and Dontre was in a scuffle with a police officer, and uh, Dontre is deceased. I'm like, you're telling me my brother dead, but why y'all just not telling us this? And his words were, we thought you would have seen it on TV. Good afternoon. The decedent is a 31-year-old male by the name of Dontre Hamilton. Now, in the course of our investigation into his background, we have learned that this is not his first experience with the Milwaukee Police Department. As recently as last year... Breaking news on Thursday afternoon, Chief Lynn's first words were, I don't want to demonize this man, but he was a uh, homeless, a robber, and all these type of things that he wasn't. Among other events, he's been arrested for armed robbery and for disorderly conduct. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and until recently, according to his grieving family, had been acting strangely. And, and they stick to this mental health issue because when you hear mental health, you think crazy. So if they can put in, in people's you know mindset that this was a crazy person who attacked the officer, um, then they feel that they have leverage within the community. We have violently mentally ill people whose violence is a direct result of their untreated mental illness. They are on the streets of our cities because there's no place else for them to go and their families cannot control them. We asked the detective that night, why did they take so long to tell us about what happened at Dontre? They said he didn't have an ID. This was in his wallet. And this a uh, rent receipt. Mm -hmm. He's got to say he's homeless, and they have proof the whole time. These are keys to his house? Mm -hmm. This is uh, a blanket you know, that was laying on the ground. Uh, I guess right by the outside. So. And this is basically the last thing he laid on at Red Arrow Park. You all right? Mm hmm And you look on the 29th, you know, the day before, I called him six times, and, you know, I talked to Don Trey April 30th. And, you know, talking to him that day, you know, it was, he sound fine, you know, he sound fine. You know, he, he didn't sound like anything was wrong. Um, you know, he asked me how I was doing, you know, he asked me if everything was good, and I was like, yeah, man, everything was good. 
You know, I think they said the shooting happened with around 3.30. Like at 3.23, my mom called Dontre on April 30th. Dontre, So this is basically when he was being killed. My mama calling because she ain't heard from him. Um, so, you know, I think that's hard to hear. You know, she calling her child in the midst of him being killed. Chief Lynch said that we need to do a better job with mental illness. That is something that is very true. But Dontre having a mental illness did not kill him. That officer murdered my brother. Because they didn't know one way or another if he had a mental illness until my mom was questioned in that car for 45 minutes. Trey got killed. I sat on the couch for two months. 435. How much is it? And I believe the whole two months I was in shock. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to feel. Me and Maria was married for 12 years. They say eyes tell everything. I seen something in her that made me want to share life with her. She got pregnant with Junior, and we became a family. And we got Junior, we got Damien, and then we got Dontre over there on the end, and me sitting in the middle, proud father. This is the house where uh, I raised my boys. It's pretty much the same. We're the first black couple within uh, 50 blocks. <laughs> well, I don't wanna. Swimming pool's gone. Cherry tree gone. I didn't want my kids in gangs, and this was more of a family-orientated neighborhood. They used to be Junior, Damon, and Dante, right? <laughs> Maria, when I met her, I believe Damon was two years old. Damon and Junior. Damon grew up to be the overseer of his brothers. And Junior, he always was the the fun one, or, you know. Don Trey was more quiet. He had to get to know you. He observed you. Yeah, right there. And you didn't see any of the sickness coming in Don Trey as he was growing up as a child. This Nate baseball picture. Him and they grew up like twins. No, this not Trey. This not Trey, no. This Nate. That's Jim? Uh-huh. Nate and Don Trey, they were two of a kind. They believed in each other. They looked out for each other, and they very seldom did things apart. When we broke up, Don Trey was 10 years old. It hurt it, Don Trey, we broke up. I think it hurt him more so than any of them. And I would never let, come here, man. <sighs> it's an emotional thing. 
would have never divorced my kids. You know, we meet with the district attorney today at 6 o'clock for his final decision on the outcome, whether he's going to charge the officer or not. And, you know, I've just been trying to get my mind to, to accept either way. So what they're we found out today, today is they're not going to charge him. I mean, well, they're not. Oh, they're not. No, no, they're not charging. They're not going to release the information today. Are you serious? Another runaround? Yeah. Uh, it is hard to put into words the turmoil that this family is going through right now. Uh, they are just having a tremendous time dealing with the fact that there hasn't been a resolution, that a charging decision has not been made. We had believed that today was going to be the day for that decision. They're not going to make any, any statements at this point. Uh, and they are again distraught. It's just devastating at this point. Anytime you're looking at a police use of force case that results in a fatality, that's a homicide investigation. You're determining whether they had a legitimate, objectively reasonable basis to use force under the, those circumstances. This particular case is complex because it occurred in downtown Milwaukee at, you know, uh, late afternoon on a work day, and you literally had hundreds of witnesses. And those have to be interviewed. You have to look at the forensic evidence. We talked with the Hamilton family about this, but there was clearly um, deep disappointment. Dontre was a big factor in our family. You know, he would say the funniest things. He would quote every movie he, he watched. He just remembered it. This is my son. See, I got my middle name from Dontre. Dontre Dion Hamilton. He was like a smooth dude. So he had like three gold rings on, a little gold necklace. And he was like a ladies' man in high school. He had a little perm. You couldn't tell him he wasn't smooth. He used to wear silk shirts when they were out of style, so. Dr. Trey never showed any signs of any kind of paranoid or schizophrenic. He was normal. He had a driver's license. Uh, he paid his own bills. That's my mommy. And no one in my family, no one in their dad's family were ever diagnosed with any kind of mental illness. So I wouldn't have even had to known the signs. My name is Bounce. When we start seeing signs of something different with Dr. Trey. It was after I ended up hurting myself at work and Dr. Trey came home and cared for me. What schizophrenia? What do we call them? We call them schizophrenic. He was staying at my house with me and he would always be sitting in the dark or he would say things like, did you hear that? You don't hear that? God gave me a child that was uniquely made. And he's gonna rest now with the same God that created him. It's an illness. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's nothing to run from. It's nothing that anybody should die for.
you know, waiting on a decision, it's, it's just hard. It's nerve wracking. I'm trying to get my life back on focus. And once I do that... We're just playing this waiting game where we can never heal as a family. And it, it's sickening. The topic that we have selected is titled A Collaborative Response to Crime and Violence in the Community. Are there others in the audience who are on the committee? Chief. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Dontre Hamilton case for the better part of six months was agreed by everyone, including the family, to have been a tragedy arising out of untreated mental illness in a public space that resulted in violence, which is what this was. We're dealing with the outcome of the reforms of the 70s with the mentally ill. Year to date, we've got nearly 8,000 calls for service having to Like deal. many other big cities, we've got a problem with untreated mentally ill people who have no options. Hey, James, how's it going? You get back on your meds and everything good? It was a mental health issue in April. Once Ferguson broke, suddenly it was a racial issue. A handful of witnesses to this shooting of Michael Brown, they have come forward. But we're hearing that there may be many more. And there were a lot of bald-faced opportunists who latched on to this family and decided it wasn't a mental health story anymore. It was a race story. When we started the Coalition for Justice, it started because we were at a rally. I say that the only thing we need to reflect on is the history that has culminated into now. You know, I was kind of like, still just getting new to all this process, but I saw a lot of courage and energy in Khalil. Let's make some noise for Ferguson. Hands up! And Curtis Sale, you know, me and him kind of clicked right away. Hands up! Curtis brought so much information um, to the group. And take a look at this. I'll, I'll type this up. Just because he stayed researching to create a plan, um, some goals. Appreciate you, girl, please. I've been giving me a history lesson. And fighting for Dontre was our, our main objective. We're not going to continue to accept what's going on in, in, in the black and brown communities. We're not going to accept what's going on around the nation. Fire and police commission, they have a responsibility to protect and serve the citizens of the community in Milwaukee. I'm just a citizen that knows my rights, and I know that you don't have the ability to put your hands on me if you haven't seen me break the law. No one has said I broke the law. No So the, the Fire Police Commission needs to discipline appropriately, and, and the officers should be held accountable when you fail to do your job properly. In this particular case, to try to fit it into the national narrative, this doesn't fit the template. I think it's a mistake to take unrelated cases thousands of miles apart with unrelated fact patterns and leap to a broad conclusion about what the police do. We're not going nowhere till the chief come out. We're going to block this exit. Hey, hey, hold on. Chief Lynn has come to go. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, hey, hey. Let them go. Let them go. Let them go. Let them go. Everybody let go. Everybody let go. When it first happened, police came to my house, I was ready to go grab a revolver and pop pop. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, that ain't gonna help. You know what I'm saying? But changing and this, this gonna help. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna keep my life in the process. And my kids gonna see that they daddy a strong black man that stand for something. 
I would say I'm a non-confrontational person, but they're not taking it serious. Even though Junior's hurting, he just wants the truth. So he can move on with his life. And to the love that he had for Don Trey, what happened that day don't set well. He was forced into a fight. You just hope the truth comes out of it where the law does the right thing, not push it under the rug. is causing some chaos on Wisconsin Avenue. Cars are not able to get by these demonstrators. They are upset over the shooting at Red Arrow Park more than four months ago of Dontre Hamilton. Uh, they have not yeah, been... You're likely to support them or no? <laughs> When I first heard initial reports, I'm like, well, Dontre don't have a, a robbery on his record, you know. But I think they just had it tangled. I think I just turned 18. My buddy had a BB gun. So we end up robbing some older guy and some younger guy. And I don't think we even got much couple lottery tickets and a watch or something like that, but it was no more than $50. But that next morning, two detectives came to the house and they basically handcuffed me right in the living room. You know, I ended up doing 18 months in community correction center with a 16 year state sentence. Some of those life lessons right there helped me to be a better person. Yes, I made mistakes, but I don't think anyone can hold me to the standard of what I was 17 years ago. I had the opportunity to speak to Dante Hamilton's mother and his brother. And one of the things that they made it clear to me that they're interested in is restoring the dignity of their son, the name, their son's name. And in particular, several items. One, Dante was not homeless. Second, he was not an armed robber. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Um, and so I want our community to know that he was neither homeless nor was he an armed robber. keep my tablet with me, practically slept with the tablet doing research about police violence. I decided that I wanted to do something for those moms because I knew how I felt. These are cute, these little porks. So I reached out to them. So for now, I'll just put it there. So from my understanding, there's a tea party. I'm foreign to tea parties. He was 15, and, and it was rough for him, you know. I'm single parenting, you know, working every day, and 
he was going mentally through some stuff that I didn't know he was going through. I still got my days, I still have my nights, and it's been 15 years. Right. You know? My son, Brandon, walked into the mental health. Um, his neck was broke. His back was broke in three places. He laid uh, in a diaper for three days, begging for his life. So um, I'm still, I still don't know what happened. Her son was shot 14 times. Yes. Mine was shot seven. Your, your husband was shot six. See, somebody is worse than, we, than me. Right, right. But I'm glad to be a part of this because I want to see something happen. And that's why I want to hold the city accountable for us sitting in this room. You have such a, 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 a strength. You see, my life still still. I knew I wasn't the same, mm -hmm. but when my father looked at me earlier this year, he, he said, I want my daughter back. He said, I haven't seen my daughter since Matt was left. And I, I haven't been. And I just, I appreciate your strength. Because God blessed me to meet you. I hate that this happened to you, but it's a strength to me. Because I kept saying, Lord, somebody got to hear me. Somebody has to care. In 11 years, and it still hurt like it happened yesterday. We need each other. Because nobody know what this feels like. And I love each and every one of y'all. I love you, too. I love all of you. United, we stand together forever. I think I was like many of the white families out there. I was kind of an ignorant professional. We grew up like a year, a year apart, so we were close. But when somebody gets killed by a police officer, it's a foot race. And whoever gets the information out first is the winner. All right, thank you, thank you. You be safe getting home. I had a son, his name was Michael Bell who was killed on uh, November 9th, 2004. And he was coming home with a night out with friends, designated driver, became intoxicated. Michael's like, you're too drunk to drive, I'm gonna drive. Michael was under the influence of alcohol, but you can look on the dash cam video, he's driving perfectly straight, pull up in front of his house, and just then uh, a squad car pulls up behind him. And uh, my son got out of the car because he was at his own home, and, but the officer pulled up and said, get back in the car, get back in the car. Get back in the car. Get back in the car. According to officer testimony, he saw this other guy in the front seat, and he grabbed Michael, and, and he took him around the back of the car and shoved him off camera. He got tased multiple times. Um, ran to the back of the house. Michael was accused of bull rushing an officer here. And uh, this is actually the car that was here. It, was, it hasn't moved in, in 10 years. And uh, sadly, that's, that's the area where Michael, uh, Michael died. You can see, Michael was shot in the morning of November 9th, 2004. On Friday, they already ruled it was justified. Before crime lab reports were complete, before autopsy was complete, before witness statements were even taken, they, they, they held their own thing and they ruled it justified. Here's a picture of Michael. I'm a veteran and I always felt that I was really a brother with law enforcement. I was a captain and this was my co-pilot navigator and boom operator at the time. For 23 years, I go out and believe in a democratic principle just to come home and have a police officer kill my child and then think I'm going to get fair and due process and the door is pretty much shut in my face. Here's data. These are news reports throughout the years. We have I go to Governor Doyle at the time. I go to the Attorney General. They don't even bother to give me a call back. But this is a contract for a billboard. I don't even know where I ran it. But I had to resort to full page ads in newspapers and billboards to get heard. Shooting justifiable, but the city settled out of court with Bell's family. 
Michael Bell's father has used the settlement money to put up billboards around the state calling for change in the way these investigations are handled. He's backing a bill that would require officer-involved deaths to be reviewed by independent authorities. What? What profession is fine investigating themselves? You cannot have colleagues investigating colleagues and think you're going to get an objective report. You're not. And there's no profession on earth who can do it. So why would we expect that of law enforcement when the stakes are so high? The law had just passed, and the John Trey Hamilton case happened a week later, and I don't think the city was ready for it. The new law required that it be an outside agency other than the Milwaukee Police Department to investigate the evidence, to interview witnesses, collect the evidence that would then be provided to the district attorney's office. What we found pretty early on in this case is it really was Milwaukee Police Department detectives that did the investigation. What was the police department's role in the investigation? Well, their only investigation is to get there fast, freeze the scene, identify witnesses, and get a preliminary idea of what happened. You know, this is midday downtown, okay? I mean, we couldn't just stand around or the hundred and some possible witnesses would all gone home. When DCI got there, it became their investigation. The outside investigation was done by DCI, um, Department of Criminal Investigation, who has a lot of different agents on it, but the ones that investigated Dontre's case was ex-Milwaukee police officers. Special Agent David Klebundy spent 25 years at MPD and is collecting a city pension of $5,000 a month. Special Agent Gilbert Hernandez spent 35 years at MPD. The challenge here, of course, in Wisconsin is we're the only big city. The rest of the state is overwhelmingly rural and suburban, right? Milwaukee is where the homicides occur. I can't get a copper from deer antler to come here and know what to do about a homicide investigation. I think the challenge, quite honestly, is no matter how many levels of review you add, for some folks, if that review doesn't result in a police officer under arrest, it's not believed. I live with a mental health issue. Do I look like a criminal to you? I'm here because I want your support. I want your help, but I can't do that if I'm afraid. So, our brother was shot 14 times. Sounds like something went wrong in that man's head, what you call a police officer. This officer, which name they won't release, but they released it to the family, so I can say his name since I knew his name, right, Chief Flynn? Christopher Manny is the officer that shot my brother 13 times, murdered my brother in Red Air Park, killed him for no reason. We have been lied to, misinformed, misled, and disrespected, and it's time for it to stop. We have to look in more detail at where Christopher Manny came from. Where was he born at? Where was he raised at? Did he have black friends? Did he have Mexican friends? And when you look in, into his record more in depth, you know that he had a, a communication problem. He had 17 other occurrences where he either used excessive force or he used vulgar language. He had a sexual assault on his record. Right, police say the clown was darting in and out of traffic here, going up to cars with squirt guns and trying to... He even beat up a white clown. ...trying to arrest him, and that's when things got heated, and the incident is all caught on camera. So who is Christopher Manny? Well, I grew up in several small towns throughout the Midwest. Came from a good Christian family and um, joined the National Guard, and then eventually college and into law enforcement. I did 13 and a half years working the street here. Everybody who was in my beat knew that they could trust me, including the street people. You know, a lot of people don't realize, but I was a single parent raising two kids. Everybody says I'm this huge racist guy, but 
My nanny's Puerto Rican and Mexican. My kids are of a different race. Today, we are going to go through the autopsy report of Dontre Hamilton. Why couldn't you just talk to him? The fact of the matter is that's all I did try to do. And the attack was so quick and so violent. You know, I kept pushing him off and he just kept attacking. What was going through your mind at that point? Just that he's going to kill me. With each of the 14 gunshots and 15 gunshot wounds, there's no stippling or unburned or burned gunpowder particles on the skin surrounding any of the entrances. So, Dontre was not within striking distance of Christopher Manning when he shot. It says at least seven of the 14 bullets traveled downward. And he had abrasions on the right side of his chin, his scalp, his neck, contusions. So that states that Christopher Manning had a field day even with his baton before he pulled out his firearm. Meeting with the district attorney, we were provided with photographs of Christopher Manny the day of the incident. And there were no visible injuries to his head, his neck, his face, his shoulders, his back. There was a very small abrasion or laceration to his thumb. There was a call from dispatch where he said he don't know if he was hit. He think he was hit. I don't even know if I was hit. It was close combat. I need an officer to help me. Now, if you got hit, or beaten, so they say, with a baton. You know if you've been struck. Instantly, I remember touching my head, and I really felt like my brains were coming out. I remember an officer touched me on the shoulder, and I said, how bad is it? Am I going to live? Are my brains pouring out? And he said, no, you've got some marks, you've got some bruising, you've got some issues, but your brains are intact. The Milwaukee Police Department has conducted a comprehensive internal investigation into the officer involved shooting of Dontre Hamilton at Red Arrow Park on April 30th, 2014. Based on the comprehensive internal investigation, I signed an order terminating Christopher Manny from his employment with the Milwaukee Police Department earlier today. In this case, Officer Manny approached this individual as though he were a criminal suspect, even though the officer self-reported that he thought he had mental problems upon his approach. The training to deal with mentally ill people tells you, um, again, absent them behaving in some menacing fashion objectively, that putting your hands on them is almost the worst thing you can do. Chief Ed Flynn says Officer Christopher Manny right. made an Chief error Flynn in judgment. Chief says by not following proper police training and protocol. Now, it's important to keep in mind I ruled that the officer violated our core value of competence, and I fired him. The DA's job is to assess criminality. You want to join us today? Sorry. So you want to join us today? Uh, no, I have to, have to. Trailers. <laughs> I was very surprised that his decision to terminate Christopher Manny didn't relate to the shooting. It only related to the fact that he felt that the pat-down search was improper. Good evening. The chief made the decision based on this officer not following procedures and ultimately ending um, Dontre's life. And I think that was a good decision. But we still want this officer to face criminal charges. You know, I was told yesterday that we will start getting intimidated. We will start being harassed. A couple people got their cars towed. They've been writing down license plates and stuff of that sort. So it's like they're watching us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Fire Police Commission. I'm here today on behalf of my police aides to present the eligibility of the appointment to police officer. We stand here before you as a diverse group. I'm not proud of the chief's actions. I think the chief was a coward. Nowhere in this entire nation, and certainly not in this city, had any officer ever been fired for something called approach considerations. I have been uh, pleading 
that our officers need to work in tandem. Should Manny have been with another officer, maybe it would have never happened because the individual would have saw that there's two of them and there's only one of me, I'm not gonna fight the situation. Probably any other officer would have patted the individual down. You know, the bulky coat, maybe the hands are in and out of the pockets, and the actions of that individual caused the situation to become what it became. Chief Ed Flynn terminated our brother officer. The firing was cowardice and unsupported by fact. What about anything that Manny did? Was there anything that he could have done differently to avoid the situation? Called in sick. The membership has voted. Their voice shall be heard. The vote. 99.3%, 99.3% voted no confidence. If the chief cannot stand before the membership and lead them properly and give them the confidence so that they can protect the community, then maybe it's time that he packs his bags. Hi, they are looking for Patrick. I certainly hope I did not create an uncomfortable situation for you. No, not at all. Michael. Hello. Chief of Staff, good morning, right. sir. How are you? I'm good. Good to see you. I'd like to uh, give you this envelope that would have been for the mayor. As you know, we invited him to join us, uh, but I'm sure... Yeah, well, as you know, the mayor has full confidence in the chief, uh, and I assume that that's going to be a difference between us. So I'll take the envelope, and thanks for coming. Thank you, sir, for accepting it. You guys have a good weekend. Wish you well. Well, Manny not only wants his job back, he also wants his money. Fox 6's Derricka Williams explains. The letter was hand-delivered Friday to the Fire and Police Commission. Christopher Manny writes, I hereby appeal from Personnel Order 2014-102, discharging me from service. Two days before being fired, Manny applied for duty disability retirement. Manny claims this incident has left him with debilitating mental health issues. The benefit process could take from 90 days to a year for a decision to be made. As for the appeal, the FPC says... Tonight we want to establish how we will behave tomorrow at the fire police commission meeting. You have the union coming in asking for the rehire of Christopher Manny. This will be the first fire and police commission meeting since officer Christopher, ex-officer Christopher Manny uh, was released from his position. They canceled the last meeting because the news of the firing had happened the day before. They think we're going to come and we're going to be rowdy. They think we're going to be obnoxious. But I, I want us to come on business. I want us to be that group that they say, hey, when an injustice is done, the Coalition for Justice is coming out. All right, good evening. This is the November 6, 2014 meeting of the Fire and Police Commission. So we will have a period of public comment. Everyone will be limited to two minutes. I want a motion that Dontre Hamilton was unlawfully killed at Red Arrow Park April 30th. Can I get anyone to second that motion? <laughs> motion has probably been second. The community has spoken. I feel like the police union is in denial. He himself says that he's unfit to do the job. Yeah. Yeah. Do the right thing and uphold the termination of Officer Christopher Mann. I and every officer have conducted the same exact investigation multiple times in a work shift. 99% of the people in this room have not been in that situation. We don't believe that every officer can do no wrong, but when one of us is used as a sacrificial lamb at the altar of mob rule, race baiting, we stand united. Any reasonable officer would have had to conduct themselves as Officer Manny did. While we are united in our statement of no confidence as to the chief, 99.3% voted no confidence, we are saddened by the loss of Mr. Hamilton. We have compassion for the family. I have prayed for peace for the Hamilton family. I'm sorry, 
very concerned to spend so much heating up in the developments of the shooting of a five-year-old. All right? Pardon me. What's your response to some of the people that thought you were being disrespectful by being on your phone and not being attentive? Then? Well, I was on my phone, and yes, that's true. I was following developments with a five-year-old little girl sitting on her dad's lap who just got shot in the head by a drive-by shooting. Now, they know all about the last three people that have been killed by the Milwaukee Police Department over the course of the last several years. There's not one of them can name last, one of the last three homicide victims we've had in this city. Now, there's room for everybody to participate in fixing this police department, and I'm not pretending we're without sin. But this community's at risk, all right. And it's not because men and women in blue risk their lives protecting it. It's at risk because we have large numbers of high-capacity, quality firearms in the hands of remorseless criminals who don't care who they shoot. And I take it personally, okay? We're going up there, and there's a bunch of cops processing a scene of a dead kid. Now, no offense, but I'm going up there now. This guy sent me a message that said, shut the F up, nigga. Same for all niggas, bunch of whining SOBs. Hope they put all you niggas in a cage where you belong, AKA prison. You know, maybe you saw me on the news talking about something, but wanting people to be better, wanting fairness, no, like what's better to do than that? You know, you have these people that say, you know, I stand with the blue and I back the blue. You know what? You got your shoes on the wrong feet. <laughs> they think that we just are out for a police officer's life. No, we're not. No, we want the police to be better. You had a good game, man. Played the defense a little better. 60% of people who get arrested have a mental health issue, but our police departments don't know how to deal with people with mental health issues. A lot of people think this training, oh, it's a pacification, and I don't want people to get it twisted. As we fight, we just don't walk the streets, we just don't yell, we change things. We want to make sure that the police department understood that their training was inadequate. Did you call the mayor? It's not here. This is his building where he works at, and we expect him to come and address the situation. You know you've talked to him a couple times already. This time, we want something in stone to make sure all officers get CIT trained um, before the year 2017. We know in this case that even though Christopher Manny walked a beat in downtown Milwaukee, he didn't have CIT training. You know, if one in five people have mental illness, we have mental illness amongst our own ranks as well. And I think people are putting an awful lot on the 40-hour course. One gun per locker. Everybody gets some version of the training, even if they don't have the entire course. You're a one-man squad, ladies and gentlemen. You get there, and it don't feel right, don't look right. My officers know how to size somebody up, that if they need a specialist, they can get one. PTSD, so her big thing was uh, noises. But it's stunning to me that there's not a social problem in America that apparently can't be solved by more training for the police. Good afternoon. Today, I am announcing that the Milwaukee Police Department will commit to having all police officers 
receive 40 hours of crisis intervention team training by 2017. Of course, the breaking news coming out of the St. Louis area, grand jury has been released. They have reached uh, a decision on whether to indict Officer Darren Wilson in the shooting death of unarmed teenager Michael Brown. We should get an announcement very this shortly. This is from a source right close to Darren Wilson. What they're telling me, and I think it's important for our legal minds who are listening to this, if there was an indictment, there would have been a suppressed indictment, and they have not asked Darren Wilson to turn himself in. Additionally, a bullet fired from Officer Wilson's weapon was located inside the driver's door. The shot was fired from inside the vehicle, striking. Your reaction to this, no indictment. You know, you, you, you look at the history of things and it's just like the same thing over and over and over. These officers get off with um, murdering a person. You know, message to DM, DHism, make the right decision. I saw one of the demonstrators putting light yeah. fluid on one of the police cars that was here as well. We're not out here to tear the city up. And they know that, but their bigger concern are other people, just like in Ferguson. Well, we ain't got no control over what other people, so agitators are doing. But they think that your family controls what everybody else does. I got to go. Be careful, be safe. I will. Okay. They on social media talking about they gonna bring gas cans and this, that, and the others. I ain't got no control over what somebody else do. The, my purpose is to march. They need to stop killing our kids. Then they wouldn't have to worry about people feeling like they want to tear this motherfucker up. Man, they just rolled up and hopped out with a gun. He just came from the march. Damn. Like, it was set up or something. Like, they just all swarmed in. We record us. We record you. Dirty motherfucker. Now, I'm going to try to hear me for a minute. And fuck us up right now. Yeah. And burn the shit down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I feel like with Khalil, it wasn't nothing wrong with his approach, you know, for myself. I'm here because I want to shut something down. It was just, as a family member of Dontre, we were trying to just do things a little softer. Good game over there. You're going to have some fun. Let's make them uncomfortable right now. Let's make them and it just transpired to an aggressive state.
I'm pretty sure around the world they would expect a, a group of, of this magnitude to loot and, 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 and steal and, and cause some type of damage, but damage is not going to get us justice. But, you know, we can't control people forever. Nate Hamilton, I'm part of Coalition for Justice. We're just bringing awareness to the community um, about the Dontre Hamilton um, situation. Um, we're just going around the back. And we're canvassing um, the Bayview area. We're just making sure uh, the community is aware of what's going on. How did he get killed? Um, he was shot by a Milwaukee police officer 14 times. And a lot of people don't watch the news, don't get home in time for the news, go to bed before the news. Yes, he's not on no information. Huh? Yeah, I just away. Away from the door and went to the right. uh, Why the Bayview neighborhood? Um. Go hands, everybody. Good night. The blood is at the doorstep. The blood is at the doorstep. And after months of protests, a crucial announcement is expected very soon now. A decision on whether a white Milwaukee police officer will be charged in the shooting death of an African-American man. From Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark has to inform people about several what he describes as anarchist groups that they are going to use blockades of the interstate system. Okay, so y'all go at one ramp, we go up the other? Yeah, we go on that ramp. Where, where's the coalition for justice? It was a civil disobedience, a direct action, and a couple people, of, well, about 50 people was arrested today. Protesters holding an emergency meeting to discuss the arrest of 74 of their and peers. The sheriff asked the governor to call in the national. The guard. national guard has been talking with Milwaukee police, preparing for any reaction to a charging decision. You've been told when final decision will come. Not at this time. No Nothing? other questions. No. Nope. All right. Uh, if there is anything else that will be done in the written statement. Thank you. As far as the highway action was concerned, it was executed as it was planned. All right, and no one on the highway got arrested. So I'll let Nate talk about the other parts. Before you do, 
good brother, if I may. The real miscommunication broke down because by the time both groups from Red Arrow got to the highway, you guys were already gone. That's not where we are. I don't care right. about none no, of that right now. We have meetings right. to what? discuss the plan. If you don't show up, you don't know. Lil, stop disrespecting my mama. I'm serious. Stop disrespecting my mama. Let my mama talk. Let my mama talk. Let my mama talk. My mama talk. She's talking. Lil, don't kick me out of nowhere. If I don't leave me alone. Right now, but the street right outside this courthouse is blocked off by Milwaukee police um, as they prepare for this group to gather. Good morning and thank you for coming. The death of Dontre Hamilton is a tragedy for everyone involved, but I cannot be swayed by passion when making these decisions. And after carefully analyzing the investigation, the forensic evidence in the case, the law, I have come to the conclusion that criminal charges are not appropriate in this case. What's significant to know is that they stated that he was shot while he was on the ground by more than six people, but he used rubber bands to describe the downward trajectory. Essentially, if this is Mr. Hamilton, it would be in a downward trajectory. If, however, Mr. Hamilton was on the ground when those shots were fired, you can see that the trajectory would generally be ascending at that point. Everything the DA did was very elementary. And for him to use some rubber bands was like, is, is this it? You know, it, it, you spent eight months and this is all you have? Again, my obligation is to review the case in light of uh, Wisconsin law. And I've done a detailed analysis of the law of self-defense. as it The unique evaluation you do with police officers is whether they had a legitimate, objectively reasonable basis to use force. Of obvious concern to everybody has been the number of shots fired. And the way that the baton was being employed at that time, whether he connected or didn't connect, that's a deadly weapon. And therefore, we wouldn't be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he had committed a crime when he used force. Understand as well, you can discharge, you know, 15 rounds in under three seconds. Time recorded 2.99 seconds for all 14 rounds fired. When police officers were equipped with revolvers, they had six shots, so they were trained differently. Fire twice and then reassess. Is 14 shots really necessary to stop an individual? Uh, the standard was that they are not allowed to employ force to kill. They are not allowed, allowed to use force to wound. They're allowed to employ force to stop the threat. My family, we cried too long. On April 30th, we sized him up and he killed him with intent. And now he has the mental problem. The whole system has a mental problem. So when will we stand up? Right, thank you, sweetheart. It was good hearing from you. I'm the... Uh, the district attorney is the wrong person to prosecute the people he worked with so closely, especially John Chisholm, knowing that he has no history of really charging an officer when it comes to um, use of force. You know, we'll just have to go to the federal level. We're going to escalate this battle as we seek federal intervention and public awareness. Dr. Ray was shot 14 times. Dr. Ray had 21 bullet holes in his body. It could have been, could have been, could have been mine. I think that's the sentiment of the president. That's the, that's, the, that's the feeling of our attorney general. And we know of the tragic death of Dr. Ray Hamilton. We don't get it. Shut it down. A young man who should still be with us. Good afternoon. The Department of Justice and U.S. Attorney's Office has indicated that they are going to go ahead and do a federal investigation. 
We'll be looking forward to that happening. The officer who shot and killed Dontre Hamilton in Red Arrow Park will soon find out if he's getting his job back. Former officer Christopher Manny is appealing his firing to the Police and Fire Commission. Manny has filed for a duty disability retirement, so even if he gets his job back, would he be back out on the street? Remain standing, sir. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Be seated. Can you describe for us what bulges you're talking about? My main focus was on the right pocket. It stuck out about an inch and a half, and it seemed like the entire pocket was filled. Did you think there was a weapon in there? It suggested that there could be a weapon such as a knife, um, a, a blade of glass. I've seen them take glass and shove in between their papers with duct tape. That That is the area where it suggested there could be a weapon. Thank you. That's all I have. Mr. Thompson. So you're ready and able to return to duty, right? No, sir. I want to return to duty. The doctors, they say I can't. But that doesn't hide the fact that I was wrongfully terminated and that I want to be a cop. It's who I am. You said that the bulge in his right pocket led you to be concerned. That it was a fear. You're like, he's probably got a weapon, and that bulge is probably a knife. And I don't have x-ray vision, but it sure looks like a knife, and you've got the behavior. Those are all things that come into play very rapidly into your assessment. So let's follow what you told the detectives and Mr. Chisholm on April 30th. Is there a mention in this report of any concern about a bulge in a right pocket? No. Is there any mention in this report of a knife or shards of glass? I don't know, sir. Thank you. That's all I've got to say. Commissioners? Um, at any time, did Mr. Hamilton make a movement towards his right pocket? No. Thank you. You may step down. If we have other officers that act like him, then they need to be removed from the force. Um, one thing's for certain that he does not need to be a police officer for the city of Milwaukee ever again. I want to direct your attention to Exhibit 136. Did you draft it for Officer Manny? I drafted it for a number of officers on the shift, yes. You wanted him to be recognized for meritorious service, right? Yes, I did. During the period that you supervised him, did you come to any opinions about Officer Manny's work ethic? Yes. What were those opinions? He was a hard worker. Would you say Officer Manny was one of the best officers you ever supervised? He was one of the best. And if Officer Manny was reinstated today, would you have any problem with him working under your command? I don't believe so. Would you welcome him back? I would. Thank you. Mr. Manny. If you feel I violated a rule, I understand that. But I ask that you do not terminate me. I want to be a cop. I've helped people my whole life. It's who I am. You have your evaluations. You have a resume to go to another job. Because the Hamilton family, all they have is the memories of Mr. Hamilton, right? That would be correct. No more questions. I am advised that the commissioner panel has reached a decision. After proper consideration of all testimony and evidence presented, I do hereby find that Christopher Manny shall be permanently discharged from the Milwaukee yeah! Police Department. On behalf of everyone involved in this proceeding, I want to thank uh, the commissioners for your time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Sorry to, I am sorry to report that I have just learned from one of my media sources that Christopher Manning was approved for duty disability. 
benefits at the meeting of the... Tuesday of last the week, they had a doctor testify that Christopher Manny was suffering from PTSD and that they were going to honor the decisions to get him his total disability, and they will be going all the way back a year. They're going to give him $5,600 a fucking month. What they done was very secretive. You know, this officer is going to receive 75% of his pay, an additional $4,000 on top of that, um, for the rest of his life. And we should be outraged as a community when these type of things happen. Um, disability for Christopher Manny is ridiculous. Um, it's, it's not just affecting me and my family, but it's affecting our city that we have to pay a cop that was fired and still can receive 75% of his pay. You mean disruption? Um, you can call it that. Right to be in that park. Can y'all stop and tell me what y'all need to do? What am I going to arrest for? This is a public park. Y'all weak as hell. I could break out of this shit with no problem. That's why y'all shoot people. That's why y'all shoot people, because y'all so fucking weak. That's what y'all shoot people for. Y'all weak ass. Y'all weak ass. What if it was your child? They didn't charge his ass. He said there wasn't enough evidence to say that he really shot him. So they first, had, like first degree murder will Yeah. They had, they had approved it was first degree murder, not intentional or any other thing. So he willfully shot him. And all the other circumstances that led up to him shooting him still didn't want to that he willfully shot him.
The U.S. Department of Justice will spend the next two years reviewing every aspect of MPD. This DOJ review was a request by Chief Flynn. The U.S. Justice Department says the idea is to improve two things, trust and relationships between police and the community. The DOJ says... And it certainly seemed clear to me that collaborative reform was the best thing to ask for in terms of trying to restore confidence where confidence may have waned, to create confidence where it may not currently exist. Uh, we're going to get this done, we're going to take our time, and we're going to do it right. Just again, tonight's uh, listening session is a, is a critical element of our assessment and the collaborative reform effort. And rather than field a lot of questions right now, I would rather for people to start coming to the mic and, and um, we can begin addressing that. Please, please do it in an orderly fashion. And I appreciate it. Good evening, my name is Deborah Jenkins. I am the mother of Larry Jerome Jenkins that was murdered in September of 2002. We have gangs within the police department, the Jump Out Boys, the Punishers, the Night Train, the Midnight Riders, and you name it. The list goes on and on and on. There's just stories that black men have to know. Don't go out without your driver's license. Don't wear a hat inside of a car. He's got to look at the police officers, where they came from, how they got here, and why are they in our communities. My name is Nate Hamilton. I'm co-founder of Coalition for Justice. Uh, I gave you a copy of the demands that me and the community discussed just yesterday. And the one I want you to particularly look at is number 12. Number 12 says, there will be consequences. We demand justice or else. There's gonna be consequences. The mayor, we're coming to you. There's gonna be consequences. Fire police commission, we're coming to you. There's gonna be consequences. District attorney, we're coming to you. There's gonna be consequences because we can't wait 18 months on the Department of Justice. You understand that? We've been waiting too long. cry out it's a cry out you know um, that's I, I say been building up for for some years here in Milwaukee There have been at least six fires that were set, including one at a BP gas station. That building is destroyed. I found out about this today because of the rioting in the city last night when I turned on the news. It, it is what it is, and this is why we have to support the police and not support um, 
nefarious groups like Black Lives Matter. You know? Last night, chaos descended upon a neighborhood in Milwaukee. And this morning, the rest of the city is left to pick up the pieces and scratch our heads and wonder why. What happened last night is completely unacceptable. And today, I activated the Wisconsin National Guard. To burn down something to them, it, it meant, do you hear us now? Nice to meet you, Nate. I'm Sonia. Nice to meet you. And, and no one's willing to come out and give them no respect, not no love, not no better education, you know, not nothing. Hey, everybody over there on that porch, hey, we need everybody to be a part of this. We gonna let our hearts Amen. come out here and heal the people. We gotta make sure that they have what they need. Whether it's mentoring for their children, whether it's school books for their kids, backpacks, contacts, we need to make sure that they don't go without We're trying to get everybody we can to come out, help clean up the streets, but we also want them to understand that what they do, someone sees. Um, your neighbor sees you, um, and they might not be um, as courageous as you. But when they see you, then maybe they grab that courage and then they come out and they start supporting the effort and cleaning up this city. 